Hi, I'm Mark Wallace. In this video, I'll be teaching you the basics of using a light meter. I'll be using the Seikonic L758DR, but the principles can be applied to other meters as well. We'll learn about the difference between incident and reflected metering. We'll learn about the different modes on our meter, and we'll put everything into practice. Your camera's built-in light meter works in many situations, but there are times when you'll need a handheld meter. Your camera's built-in light meter can be confused by bright glares or highly reflective surfaces, or when you have a very bright or dark scene. And your camera's built-in meter isn't able to meter light from a studio flash. So if you're working in the studio, you'll need a light meter. Well, let's begin by talking about the exposure triangle and how it applies to metering. Our camera uses three things to create a proper exposure. The shutter, the aperture, and the ISO setting. These three things make up the exposure triangle. The aperture, shutter, and ISO work together to give you the correct exposure. With a light meter, you enter the ISO and one other part of the exposure triangle, and the meter gives you the third part. For example, you can enter the ISO and the shutter speed, and when you take a reading, the meter will give you the correct aperture value. Or you can enter the ISO and the aperture value, and the meter will give you the correct shutter speed. If you're metering studio strobes, you'll always enter the ISO and the shutter speed, and the meter will give you the correct aperture value. Using a meter is very simple. Just remember, we entered two parts of the exposure triangle, and the meter gives us the third part. For example, let's say I'm shooting a portrait on location, and I know that I want to use a wide aperture of, let's say, f2.8 to achieve a very shallow depth of field. Well, I'd enter my ISO and aperture value on my meter, take a reading, and the meter would tell me what shutter speed to use for a proper exposure. Or if shutter speed was important to me, I could enter the ISO and the shutter speed, and the meter would tell me what aperture value to use for a proper exposure. We can use our meter to measure ambient light and light from a flash. Now, there are two ways to meter light. There's incident and reflected metering. Let's take a look at these two types of metering. There are two types of metering, incident and reflected metering. Reflected metering measures light that is reflected off a subject and into the meter. Incident metering measures light that is falling on the subject itself. It's best to use incident metering in most cases because you're metering the actual light falling on a subject. You don't have to worry about problems caused by a glare or a background that's extremely bright or dark. Now, the meter uses the lumosphere when it's set to incident metering. You place the lumosphere right where your subject is and point it directly at your camera's position, which is why you can rotate this. So you're placing this right where you want it to be, pointing it right at the camera. And you can also retract the lumosphere in incident metering if you're metering something like artwork and you only want to meter the light that's directly hitting your subject. It can also be used if you want to meter light from a single light source or for metering light ratios. Now, reflected metering uses a viewfinder. You actually look through the meter like a telescope, like this. And there's a little circle inside the viewfinder, and you line that up with your subject, and that's what the meter is measuring. Now, reflected metering is also known as spot metering. This method measures the brightness of the light that's reflected from the subject. And it's great for distant objects like landscapes, or when you can't go to the position of the subject, or for metering subjects that generate light, like neon signs. It's also useful for very highly reflective surfaces or translucent subjects like stained glass windows. Let's take a closer look at the basic controls on our meter. Now, at the top of the meter is the lumosphere. Now, this little white dome is what actually gathers the light for incident meter reading. Now, you can twist this and you can retract that for different purposes. And on the side of the meter is a little eyepiece and it's got a viewfinder. So you can actually look through the meter to measure reflected light. Now, you can choose between incident or reflected metering by turning this little dial here on the side of the meter. Now, we'll talk more about incident and reflected metering a little bit later. Now, the ISO 1 and ISO 2 buttons allow you to set the ISO value on your meter. Now, to do that, I'll just push the ISO 1 button, and then I will roll the jog wheel right here, and you'll notice that the ISO value is changing. And I can do the same thing with the ISO 2 value. 
And the nice thing about having two different ISO buttons is that you can have two different ISO values if you're working with multiple cameras at different settings. Now to take a reading, we use the measure button. That's this button right here on the side of the meter. And so when I say I'm taking a reading, I'm pressing that measure button and the meter is measuring the light to tell me what to set my camera to. Now we can tell the meter what we're metering and what we want it to tell us by setting the mode. Now to change the mode, we can press the mode button right here. Just press and hold and then rotate the jog dial. And so as we do that, you'll notice at the very top here, as I'm rotating the jog wheel here, you can see that our modes are changing and we'll go through those modes. So let's begin by looking at ambient metering mode. Now ambient metering mode is used to measure always on light like the sun or lights in the house. Now it's used for any light that's not a flash. Now the thing I like about ambient metering mode is that I can use my meter uh, much like I can my camera in either aperture priority or shutter priority modes. And let me show you how to do that. So I'm in my uh, ambient light mode there. And as I roll this jog wheel, notice that now I have the ambient light mode uh, activated and this T has a square around it. And what that means is as I turn my jog wheel, I am setting the shutter speed on my meter. And when I take a reading, the meter will tell me my aperture value. So that's like shutter priority mode. So I'm setting the ISO and the shutter and it's telling me what aperture value to use. Or I can push the mode button, roll the jog wheel to the right. Now notice that the F has a square around it. Now I can turn the jog wheel to set the aperture value. And when I take a reading, it tells me the shutter speed to use. And that's like aperture priority mode on my camera. Now the meter has several modes for metering light from one or more flashes. Now remember, when you're metering a flash, you always enter the ISO and shutter speed on the meter, and then the meter will tell you the correct aperture value to use. So let's begin by looking at the auto reset cordless flash mode. I know that's a mouthful, but you can use this mode when you don't have to or you don't want to use a sync cable, a cable like this one. Now let me first put this on that mode. So I'll push the mode button, rotate the jog wheel, and notice I have this little flash icon and uh, my shutter speed, I can change that. And now what I can do is when I press the measure button, the meter will wait for up to 90 seconds for a flash to fire. And when a flash fires, the uh, meter automatically measures that light and will give me the correct aperture value to use. It's very convenient when you don't have an assistant or don't have a sync cable to use. Well, the next mode is cord flash mode. So I'll push the mode button, rotate this jog wheel to the right, Notice now I have a flash with a little C next to it, and that stands for cord flash mode. Now you use this mode when you're using a sync cable to tell your flash to fire. So I'll turn on a flash here, and notice I actually have a sync cable, and there's a PC port right here, and that allows me to connect a sync cable right here to my flash, and now when I push the measure button, my flash fires. And that's really cool. Well, a lot of people don't like using this cable here, and so there's another mode that we can use, and that's called the wireless flash radio trigger mode. So when I push mode, I'll rotate this to the right. Notice that I have this little number flashing. That's the channel that activates the radio. So right now I've got a pocket wizard radio built into this meter, and it's saying use channel one. And that is what my flash is set to. I can change that to any number of channels up to channel 32. Right now we're gonna stick with one. I'll hit mode, go one more to the right. Now notice I have a little flash with an antenna. That's saying I'm on the wireless flash radio trigger. And now when I hit the measure button, there's a radio inside here, a pocket wizard, that will activate this flash. So when I push this, the flash fires. And that is awesome because I can use that instead of using a clunky sync cable. Metering in ambient mode is very simple. And now, as I mentioned before, you can set your meter to meter for a shutter priority or an aperture priority mode. So you get to choose what's most important to you. Now to me, in this scenario, the depth of field is the most important thing. And so I'm metering at an aperture value of 4.5. I have my meter set to an ISO value of 200. So my meter will tell me the correct shutter speed. So what I'm gonna do here, so I've got that all set up. I'm gonna meter with the Lumisphere up I'm gonna point the Lumisphere toward where my camera is going to be, which is right over there. I'll take a meter reading. And this tells me I need to shoot at a shutter speed of 80th of a second. So Sam, if you'll hold that. I'll just walk right over here, set my camera to an 80th of a second, and we'll take the shot. And that looks terrific. 
Let's take a closer look at how we can use incident metering in the studio. Now I've already set my meter to my camera's ISO setting, which is 100, and my camera's sync speed, which is 200th of a second. All I need to do now is solve for the third thing, which is my aperture value. Now I have a very simple lighting setup. I just have an umbrella, and I also have a reflector on this side of Sam. And so to meter this, I'm gonna come right back in here and I wanna make sure that I'm metering straight to my camera. So my lumosphere is going to be right underneath Sam's chin and I'm pointing it right at my camera. Now the reason I'm back here is if I was on this side, I'd be blocking the light that's being reflected from this reflector. If I'm up here, I'm blocking the light that's coming from this light. So I'm gonna stand back here and I'm going to meter right to my camera. I get a meter reading of 11. So I'll just come over here to my camera, set my camera's aperture value to 11 and then I'll take the shot. So look right this way, Sam. Beautiful. I love it. Well, here I am in downtown Phoenix, Arizona, and I just took some pictures of the Phoenix Convention Center that's right behind me. Now that caused some issues when metering because we have a really bright sky, some really bright areas in the scene, and some really large, dark windows. So I needed to make sure that I didn't have anything overexposed. And also, it's not really close to me, so I can't use my incident meter. I need to use reflected metering. So the first thing I did was put my meter in reflected metering mode, and then I started metering at the very brightest areas on the building, and then I metered those dark windows, and then I pushed the average button, and my meter told me that at F13, I needed to use a shutter speed of 500th of a second. Once I had that all dialed in, I took some pictures and look at what we got. Another reason you might want to use reflected metering is in the studio to understand the relationships between your brights, midtones, and darks. And so let's head over to the studio and I'll show you that right now. So this scene is a, a very high contrast scene where we have panels that are going to be some gray. This middle one is completely black. And this other one is also a dark gray. And then Sam has a very contrasty look as well. We have a grid illuminating her and we have this very bright light falling on her hair. I wanna make sure that all of that falls within my camera's dynamic range. And to do that, I've calibrated my meter to my camera. And at the bottom of the meter, I have a scale. And as I'm metering different things in my scene, those different things will show up as dots on my scale and I can see immediately if things fall within my camera's dynamic range. Now one thing I have to mention and that is that where you meter matters. For example, this panel right here, this black panel, I have that illuminated by this light that's just sort of skimming that panel. And if I meter through here and it's re, uh, metering the reflective light, well, there isn't light reflecting at a 90 degree angle. And so that's going to show up uh, very underexposed in my meter reading. However, if I go to where my camera is and I meter there, so I'll come over and meter it this way, it is getting that reflection and so it will meter it completely different. So where you're standing matters quite a bit when you're doing reflective metering. So for this, I'm going to meter everything from the position of my camera, I'll be right in line with that and I should get great readings. So to start with, I wanna set my middle gray value. So I'm using a gray card. So Sam, hold that right up. I'm going to switch my meter to reflective metering. I can look right through here. I'll take a reading and then I'll push my memory button. And now that has a middle gray uh, point on my scale and everything will be in relationship to that. So the first thing I wanna do is make sure that middle panel is going to fall into complete darkness. I want it to show me that it's outside of my camera's dynamic range. It should show underexposed because I want it to be black. So I'm going to meter just on that middle panel there put that in memory and we can see that it is well below the proper exposure, which is exactly where I want it to be completely black. The next thing I wanna do is check out the two gray panels on the sides to make sure that they're very dark, but not underexposed completely. So first I'll get this one that's closest to me. I'll put that in memory. I'll get the one behind Sam, put that in memory. When I take a look at that, I can see that those will both be dark. This one's very dark, that one's more gray, but they're within my camera's capabilities. The last thing I need to check is to make sure Sam's hair is not overexposed with that hair light. So I'm going to meet her right on her hair and I'll lock that in and it shows me that that will be captured uh, just fine as well. So the last thing I want to do is put this back to incident metering. Come over here, I'll meter this right underneath Sam and that gives me a metering value of 10. That's what I'll set my camera to. That'll give me a proper exposure, but I know that all of the relative values are well within my camera's range. 
Well, we've learned a lot today, but it's really just the tip of the iceberg. To learn more about metering, visit MacOnCampus.com.